So I'd like to thank the organizers for asking me to help organize. Um, okay. So, um, main interest that I have that got me into this field of regulatory genomics is that I'm very interested in how is it possible that you take the same genome, the same DNA sequence, and that these very constellations of these small regulatory sites are read out to produce these, these very different phenotypes. So these are all human, human cells, and they all have the same genome, right? And they make these very different phenotypes. So I want to understand how does this work as a, on the level of a system the kind of questions that I'm interested in is, is what is a cell type anyway? Can we rigorously define what a cell type really is? And how is the identity of such a cell type stabilized, given that we know that you know, all the processes involve small molecules and extremely noisy. When you look at single cells, you start realizing how noisy these things are. So where is the information? Okay, how does the cell know what type it's supposed to be and, and stay? And what are, the, what are the things that matter? And what are all the details that we can ignore? And as, as you've noticed um, yesterday during the discussion, so as the amount of uh, high throughput data has been increasing and increasing exponentially or super exponentially, my sort of uh, pessimism has been growing super exponentially that we would be able to sort of answer these questions that we're interested in. So I think, you know, we, we think that we know and measure a lot about these systems, but I believe that there are orders of magnitude more things that we don't know about, and, and these high throughput measurements are, are full of artifacts that we very poorly understand in general. And, and so I think we're, we're nowhere near the ability to, to, to answer these questions that I'm actually interested in. So the, the, the question for me is, so what useful things can I do if I want to be a serious computational biologist? And one thing is, well, you could start a wet lab and do something else. Okay, so that I actually did this uh, five years ago. And so this slide is just a plug for the first sort of major work that's coming out of our wet lab. So this, this was in eLife last year. And so you should all go read this paper. I'm extremely excited about this. And I think we, we, so we were studying, we were evolving synthetic promoters in E. coli in the lab to study how natural selection has acted on gene expression noise in native promoters. We were very surprised to find that synthetic promoters, even if you don't select them for noise properties, are low noise, and that regulated promoters in E. coli are all high noise, and we came up with some new insights in how actually the propagation of, of noise from a regulator to its targets is actually beneficial in very general conditions. And you can think of that almost as a rudimentary form of, of, of regulation, right? So just something pushing on another thing in a random way is often beneficial, all right? And this allows you now to see a very general mechanism how you can evolve gene regulation de novo from a state without gene regulation, all right? But this is not what I will talk about today. So the other thing that, that we're still trying to do in the context of regulatory genomics is to develop very simple, robust, and transparent methods that can help experimentalists interpret their data and guide the next experiments that they're doing. So that, I think this is sort of about as much as I think I can contribute. So one of the main sort of systems that we've been working on, starting with this, this Phantom Four project, now this is already, what is it, six, seven years ago, is we developed a system we call this motif activity response analysis where we start by predicting regulatory sites genome-wide in, say, all promoters for a, a very large number of, of uh, regulatory motifs, so hundreds of motifs in mammalian cells. And then we, once we have these, these annotations, so we end up with some big matrix that gives you for every promoter in the genome and each one of these hundreds of regulatory motifs, how many binding sites are there in this promoter for this motif. And then we take either expression data, gene expression data, or, or chipset data with you know, chromatin state in promoters. And then we use a very simple linear model that says the expression in promoter P of, in sample S of promoter P is some sum over all motifs the number of binding sites in this promoter for this motif times some unknown activity of this motif in this sample. And so we fit these motif activities to, to try and estimate expression. Now, 
So this is an extremely simple model, and you can, so if you assume that the, the deviation between model and, and uh, the experimental data is Gaussian, you can solve this all, you know, without any, any problem, exactly get the entire posterior distribution. And, and these, and you will see that you will able to only capture a few percent of the variance in the data. So these, these very, very simple linear models, they do terrible in fitting the gene expression data, which is maybe not surprising. But we found that they consistently do very, very well in identifying what are the key regulators in the system and their regulatory interactions up initial, right? So here to give you some one example, if you, this is, so this is just some data we downloaded. So these are time course measurements of human umbilical vein endothelial cells that are treated with TNF-alpha. And biologists know that if you do this, you treat these cells with TNF-alpha, you induce an innate immune response. If you just give this, this time course expression data to this motif activity response analysis, it up in issue identifies what are the key regulators, so NF-kappa B and IRF factors. How are these how are their activity of these factors changing in time, even direct regulatory interactions between these transcription factors, and what you know, aspects of the innate immune response, what downstream pathways are these different regulators responsible for, right? So it should be clear that innate immunity is very well studied, and this is why I'm showing it to you as an example, because you can confirm with the literature that, that, that these things make sense, right? But for, so for a biologist that is interested in understanding regulation in, in his or her system, and that only have these sort of genome-wide gene expression data, it can be very useful to get predictions of these kind that say, these are the key regulators, these how they're changing their activity in time, these are the genes they're targeting, because they'll tell them what kind of follow-up experiments to do, perturb these transcription factors, and so on, to learn more. So what we've been working on for nearly five years since we first developed this sort of approach is to try and completely automate this. Right, so make this completely automated and, and robust. And so we now have a, a website. You can go to this website, and the only thing you need to do is upload your raw data and then click a button. So there are no parameters, nothing. You just, you just say go. And then basically the, the entire analysis is done, and it gives you sort of uh, interactive HTML pages with the results that tell you what are the key regulators in the system, what are the activities of these regulators across the input samples, what are the target genes and pathways that each of these regulators target, what are the regulatory sites on the genomes through which these regulators act, and what are the interactions between the regulators themselves. Right, and I think, and, and this has been a very rewarding experience because there are many, many experimental labs that have now gone and used this and done follow-up experiments with these predictions and find that it really helps them to learn about what is sort of the, how the regulation is acting in their system. All right, so for this talk today, so this, this uh, program is also supposed to be about algorithms and so on, so I want to tell you a little bit about uh, work that we've done for modeling transcription factor binding specificity going beyond these specific position-specific weight matrices. So a number of people have already talked about with HD cell excitative PW, uh, PBM data, we know that, uh, that the position-specific weight matrix models may not be sort of sufficient to describe really the binding specificities you see, and so I will tell you sort of about an approach that we developed to try and look at this. So just to set this up, I want to remind you that when you, when you infer a position-specific weight matrix, so the key kind of quantity that you calculate is that if I have some alignment of short sequences, capital S, I want to calculate what is the probability of this set of sequences deriving from some weight matrix um, W. And this probability can be written as a product over all the columns in this alignment, right? So because the key assumption of a, a weight matrix is that these columns are independent. And then for each column, you basically have the product over all letters alpha. And then the weight matrix entry, so the probability of having letter alpha at position i, to the power how many times ni alpha did you see letter alpha at position i, all right? So this you can calculate if you know the weight matrix, but the point is, of course, that you typically don't know the, the weight matrix. So probability theory tells you that if you want to calculate the probability that all these sequences s came from a, a, a common weight matrix, what you need to do is you have to have a prior distribution of possible weight matrices. 
and then integrate it out, right? So you calculate this likelihood times the prior and integrate it over all possible weight measures. And if you, if you use a Dirichlet prior, I mean, so that it's sort of, you can wave your hands and have sort of semi-rigorous ways of justifying why you need a prior of this type, but so let's just assume you use a prior of this type. Then you can do these calculations analytically, and you get these answers that have these gamma functions in it, right? So for, for this, if you look at one weight matrix column here, let's say column I, the probability that um, these derive from, from a, a weight matrix uh, is basically given as a product over all letters and then the gamma function of how many times you see it, plus this lambda, which was this parameter of the Dirichlet prime. All right. So now I want to generalize this and look generally at, at pairs of columns. So instead of looking at single columns at a time, we're going to look at, at pairs of columns. And so this goes back to a, a model that was developed by this uh, extremely good PhD student that I used to have called uh, Lucas Burger. And we first used this for, for predicting interactions in, in proteins and, and, and contacts in, in protein structures. Um, and so we have been adapting now this model uh, to describe uh, transcription factor binding specificity. All right, so the way this works is that, so previously we were looking at these single columns at a time, right? So this is column I and column J, and these are characterized by the counts of how many times you see letter alpha at this column, how many times you see letter beta. And so now when I have a pair of columns, I have dinucleotide frequencies, right? So these, uh, this is the number of times that I see the combination alpha, beta at position ij, and now I can calculate the probability for these pairs of columns that just generalizes what we did for a single column. So instead of having a uh, um, you know, position-specific weight matrix, you have now a sort of dinucleotide weight tensor that is just the probabilities of all the combinations of letters appearing at this column. And when you integrate over this, it just works the same way. It's just now you have a let, uh, alphabet of size 16 letters instead of four. You again get these expressions in terms of, uh, of gamma functions. And so now, in particular, what you can calculate is a likelihood ratio of how likely is this pairs of columns under this sort of richer model of dinucleotides relative to uh, the, the product of the probabilities of these columns under the weight matrix model. And you can show, actually, if you do the Sterling uh, approximation of these gamma functions, you can show that this ratio is roughly e to the number of, total number of observations in the column times the mutual information. All right, so it is, uh, these, these gamma functions, they do the, the finite size corrections correctly, but in the limit of large counts, this, these R functions is just E to the power of the mutual information in the two columns times the number of letters. All right, so we use these things to now take an alignment and write down the, the probability of the entire alignment in terms of these pairwise dependencies. Right, so when we did a weight matrix, all the columns are independent, so the probability of the entire alignment is just the product of the probabilities of the columns. And now what we're going to say is, well, we're going to draw some tree that for each position in this alignment specifies one position. So for each position i specifies position pi i that this position is dependent on. All right? And so uh, if specifying this set of parent positions for all nodes is equivalent to giving a spanning tree of all the, uh, of all the uh, positions in this alignment. And once I give you such a spanning tree, so then that specifies a factorization, right? So it says now the probability of the alignment is the probability of the first position. So in this case, this is the root of the tree. Then the probability of the second given the first, the probability of third given the second. So this fourth one in this tree also depends on the first position. This i depends on the third position, and so on. Right? So you get a product of all these conditional dependencies. So if I write this out, so notice that this, so this is the, pr the probability of the root column, and then the prob product of the over all positions that are not the root. And this conditional probability is just the joint probability of the two columns divided by the, the probability of the parent column. But if I now also divide by, by the marginal probability of this column, I just basically get these, these R. 
So what it, what it shows you is that once I give you such a factorization, I can write this probability as the original weight matrix probability, because this is the original weight matrix pro probability, times the product over all edges in this tree, and then these, these likelihood ratios for each of the, of the edges in the tree. Now, I don't know this tree. Right? So I've assumed that I know what the dependencies are in this previous slide, but I don't generally know this. So probability th theory then tells me I have to put a prior on the space of possible trees. So I will use a uniform prior because I will assume I know nothing about it. And then I simply have to, to sum over all these possible trees right? So to calculate a, a probability. And so what I would have to calculate is so this here, this is again the weight matrix part. So I would have to sum over all possible trees pi and then for each tree, the product over all edges in the tree times these uh, R factors, these dependency factors for each edge in the tree. So for example, if I had only three positions, these would be the three possible spanning trees. And so this, this probability would be proportional to this, uh, this sum here. Right? Now the beauty is that by a generalization of the Kirchhoff or matrix T tree theorem, you can actually calculate this sum as the determinant of a matrix. So what you do is you take your matrix R, you take the Laplacian of this matrix, which essentially means that you put minus the sum of the rows of the columns on the diagonal. And if you then take any minor of this matrix, so you remove a row and column and take the determinant, that is in fact, in fact exactly equal to this sum. All right. So the thing is, we can easily calculate this. So we can calculate the probability of, the, of, of, of any alignment under this general model with pairwise dependencies, not knowing which positions depend on which, summing over this by really calculating a determinant of a matrix. Okay? So once you see that, you can also see how you can now use these kind of models to predict binding sites. So let's say that I have this alignment of sites that I know are binding sites for, for a transcription factor, and I now want to calculate the probability that this sequence little s is a binding site for the same transcription factor, then essentially what I just need to calculate is the probability of little s coming from the same model as this set capital S, which is just the, the probability of, this, of the bigger set that includes now little s divided by the probability of the set without little s, and because I, I just showed you I can calculate that this is then now given by the, a ratio of such determinants times a, a factor which would be the previous um, weight matrix factor, right? So if I would do this under the weight matrix model, this would be the probability of this sequence little s given the set capital S. And now there is this extra factor, which is this ratio of determinants of these R uh, dependencies that encodes the extra evidence that is in all these dependencies between positions. So you can then also use this, yes? So why are you going through these trees at all? I mean, why, why do you think you need the trees in the first place? As opposed to? To just working with all the pairwise dependencies as you, as you did originally. Because I still need to write down a likelihood model for my data, right? I need some way to say what is the likelihood of this set of sequences under this model. And it contains all these pairwise dependencies. And so if I only want to look at pairs, it, it, uh, all the trees are all the possibilities I have. Make sense? Right, so, I'll, uh, so the, way this, this, the way this works, so when we do motif finding with this thing, is let's say you start with, you have a, a weight matrix. And you start with your weight matrix, and you predict sites for this weight matrix. Now you take the alignment of this site, and you get these dinucleotide counts from your alignment. And you can do this by, by weighing each of these sites by the posterior probability. And then you can do this, the standard EM thing, because you can now use these dinucleotide counts to make your matrix R. And then once you have your matrix R, you can calculate the probability for where other sites are appearing. And you iterate this in the, in the, in the standard EM way until it converges. Who else has a question? No? I was just wondering how that compares maybe by intuition to the maximum entropy models that people build for supply sites, where you also have pairwise and triplet dependencies. So your, OK, so. 
Uh, yeah, this is uh, really one of my hobby horses, but it takes a little bit long to explain this. Um, so these maximum entropy models, they typically what they do is they fit one set of parameters as opposed to, uh, as opposed to integrating over them, okay? Um, so I guess that's the main difference. But they then give themselves slightly bigger space of models, right? So I have to go through these trees to be able to do the integrals. They can do more general random mark of fields where I can no longer do the integral. Okay, and so the question is, are you overfitting when you're fitting the things or so, right? Okay, so this, in the, in the protein contact prediction thing, this, there's some interesting sort of developments I've been talking to these people of contrasting these approaches and, and seeing uh, what sort of works better. And I don't know really the answer yet, which of the approximations is sort of we, uh, weaker. All right, so we've, um, so we have to test this, so we took uh, a, a large um, set of chipset data sets from ENCODE. So we got binding peaks for all these, and then we divided the, thousand, the top 1,000 peaks for each of these 83 different transcription factors. We divided it into 500 training peaks and test peaks. And then basically what we did is that we, in parallel, fit a weight matrix model on this data, on the training data, and fit our DWT model on this data, right? And so, for example, afterwards, you can then look at the, the, the predicted distribution of bind, uh, binding energies that each of these binding peaks have. And then we needed to calculate basically a score that says which of these two is, is, is performing better in explaining the chipset data. So we spend a little bit of time of thinking about what is actually a good way of writing down a score for how well does a particular motif explain a chipset data set? And so what we, did, what we came up with in the end is a sort of an uh, idealized IP in vitro like IP experiment where I'm imagining that you have a pool of sequences that contains all the binding peaks we observed plus a very large number of sort of background sequences. And then you ask, if I now calculate how many, with my motif, how many binding sites there are in each of these sequences, and I assume that the probability that when I fish with IP one sequence from my pot, that the probability is proportional to how many copies of the transcription factor are bound to this sequence, then I can calculate the probability of the data, which is the probability that I will fish out all my binding peaks and only my binding peaks and nothing else. All right, so for, for any individual sequence S in this pot, you can calculate how many sites I, do I predict are in S, how many sites are expected to be bound, divided by the total number of transcription factors bound to all sequences in the pot. That's the probability that if I now fish one with IP that I will that I will fish out sequence S, and then that the probability of my data set is just the, the product over all sequences that I actually observed in my set of peaks. Okay, so this is this score that we calculate, and so when we, when we do this on these 80-some uh, transcription factors from ENCODE, so we see these are the scores of the PWM model, and this is uh, of our dinucleotide weight tensor model, and you see that in, basically in none of the cases does this dinucleotide weight tensor do worse than the PWM. And there are many cases where it doesn't make a lot of difference, but there are also quite some cases where it makes quite a difference. So here you see the, this is the log likelihood difference per binding peak uh, across all these um, different transcription factors. And so I, I think it's important to realize is that the reason I think that we do not overfit is because there are no tunable parameters in this, okay? There's basically zero tunable parameters. Everything is rigorously integrated out of the likelihood functions. You're not fitting anything. And so when there is no evidence in the data that there are dependencies between positions in the binding sites, then you will also not predict any, and basically your DWT model will, will um, reduce to a weight max model. Is the, is the width of the model not a tunable parameter? Yes. So that's also integrated. So no, that's correct. You're right. I have to set 
what what I believe is the size of the model. Okay. So yes. I comment on the list of TFs. So um, you have SMC three and CTCF. Uh, they bind to very similar regions, <coughs> they're cohesive components. Uh, this one, these two, right, the first yeah, two, yes, this is true. Hmm? Red 21 is the third TF. You're asking me where is Rat 21? Yes. <laughs> okay, so I, I would have to ask the student, maybe, may, maybe, maybe this data set was not included in the set. I have to double check. Yeah, it's there, it's number 12. 15, maybe. In the middle of the list. Oh, right there. Yeah, you just passed it. Yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting because those three bind to almost the same regions in the genome. Yeah, but I, now I would like to come back to sort of Harman also, or was it Harman that made this thing that yeah, I've been amazed many times in that I can have PWM models even, that when I look at them by eye, I cannot distinguish. And when I go and predict binding sites, let's say in all promoters genome-wide for these things, they come out quite different. So sometimes, you know, it's hard, you know, you looked at these peaks and say, well, this is pretty much the same. Sometimes it's hard to really... The sites may be very different, underlying the peaks. They might be, yes. And also, like, um, MFK and NRSF have repressive TFs. Yeah, this is REST, right? Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, yeah, I have no comment to that. I mean, whether this makes sense that they're oppressive or not. All right, so I just want to, five minutes? Okay, that's great. Then I can make a plug for this other project. So this is a project of a fantastic master student. This uh, just blew me out of the water, really. Um, that, so, so you've seen, right, we do a lot with predicting binding sites and the modeling expression data in terms of these binding sites. So now that there are all these ChIPSEC data sets, I thought, well, we should start using these sort of systematically to use them to get more motifs for factors that we don't have yet and maybe even use the ChIPSEC data to annotate where these things are known to bind in certain tissues and put this in our models. And when we started doing that, I found out that sort of ChIPSEC data analysis is wild west. So there's almost no standardized procedure, sort of either, even within consortia like ENCODE, quite different things are done on different data sets. And so I found it impossible to use, analyze data from other people and, and sort of systematically compare them across many transcription factors. So eventually we were sort of forced to develop our own pipeline to systematically treat these chipset data sets in the, in the same way. So this, this is what we've done. So, and, and like with this ISMARA, with the motif activity response analysis, we really did our best to make this completely automated. So we now have a web server. This is not yet published. I'm putting the paper on the archive as we speak. Um, but you can go to the website and already use it. So where you just upload your raw data and the pipeline does everything from the quality filtering, checking if there are any adapters left, mapping the reads, uh, estimating the size of the fragments, doing all the peak calling, and then comprehensive regulatory motif analysis. And sort of, I just want to focus on, on one or two things that are novel about this. So one thing is, so when you do peak calling, so you first use, you, you look for regions that are enriched in chipsec signal, so you slide some, some window of a few hundred base pairs across the genome, and then in each of these windows you compare how many reads were there in the, in the IP sample with how many reads were in the background, and you need some statistical model to say whether this is statistically enriched. And so this is something where I think we've taken a slightly different approach than in, in most models. So already a long time ago when I was analyzing cage data from, from Riken, we developed a model for the, the noise in next generation read uh, sequence coverage in, in replicate samples, biological replicate samples. And, it, and this model basically has multiple, multiplicative noise followed by Poisson sampling. And you can show um, that you can well approximate the, um, this model as follows. So the, what I call the enrichment X is the log. So it's the difference 
of the log of the fraction of all reads. So little n is the number of reads in the IP. Big N is the total number of reads in the IP. So this is the log of the fraction of all reads that map to this window in the IP. This is the fraction of all reads that map to this window in the input sample. The difference I call the enrichment. And this model predicts that this enrich if there is no enrichment, right? So if there's just fluctuations, then this x should follow a Gaussian distribution, but with a variance that actually has two components. One component comes from this multiplicative noise, so that has some, some variance sigma squared. And then there is basically variance that is coming from the Poisson sampling that goes like 1 over n plus 1 over m, which are the raw read counts. All right? And so what we then do is we, we, we fit a mixture model where we say the, all the windows across the genome either come from this background uh, model or they come from some uniform distribution where the enrichment could be anything. And then we fit the three parameters, right? So mu, this shift, sigma, and rho to the data. And once we fit that to maximize the likelihood of the entire chipset profiles, we can now basically for each window calculate a Z statistic, which is here, uh, which is given here. And so if there were no enriched windows at all, these set statistics should follow a standard normal. All right? And if you now make plots of what is the distribution of Z statistics that you observe here in black compared with the standard normal, you see that indeed the vast majority of the genome follows this, this distribution. And you can then quite you know, sort of rigorous, rigorously pick cutoffs on the Z score so that your total false discovery rate is, let's say, 10%. I think this is actually important because we've used this also to see when we do not trust the enriched peaks. Okay, so when the experiments work well, you find that these distributions fit very well. And so you feel confident that you know what an enriched region is really enriched. Sometimes when something goes wrong, these black distributions look crazy and you know that there's probably a trouble and, and you shouldn't really um, trust these. And so in the regulatory motif analysis, so what we do is we, so in the past I've, I've developed various algorithms for doing motif finding up in issue, especially taking into account comparative genomic information. So we take peak regions, we find autologous regions in other genomes, we make alignments, and then we run these de novo motif finders, so we get a collection of de novo motifs. And then we combine that, so we've collected a large library of known motifs, so there's like 2,300 motifs from all these, these various res resources. And then, that, and then what we do is we try to find a set of complementary, so non-redundant motifs that jointly observe the explained binding peaks. And we use this same enrichment score that I showed you previously of how likely is it to pull out um, the sequences that you actually observed if you assume that the probability of pulling out the sequence is proportional to the predicted number of binding sites for this set of motifs. And um, yes, yeah, so for example, for here, so as for, for one example, so for ATF2 from, from the ENCODE data set, right? So we, we find that the most predictive motif is some sort of novel motif, but then actually you can add a number of uh, motifs from, from this library that are complementary to, to this, and then jointly uh, these motifs better explain uh, the, the binding size. Um, so I will just focus. So one thing that really struck me, and to come back to your. No, not have time. Huh? Not have time. <laughs> OK, good. So thank you. Um, so I'll just summarize and give you acknowledgment. So basically, I told you about this um, website, uh, web server that we developed for automated chip sex analysis. I um, encourage you to go there and look at our results on the full ENCODE data sets. And I told you about the dinucleotide weight tensor models for taking uh, dependencies between positions in binding sites into account. And this work was done by uh, Saito Midi, and the main work on the, um, was done by Severin Berger, and Lukas Berg Burger originally um, developed this Bayesian uh, dinucleotide weight tensor model. All right, so thank you very much. Who do you want first? Go ahead.
try to apply or validate the dinucleotide model on in vitro data? I mean, because it's just yes. it's so problematic, so let's go to PBM or something. Yes, we have. And <laughs> okay, so so what we've done is that we've taken the motifs that we, we fitted on the chipsec data, both the weight matrix and the DWT, and then looked for HT Selex data where the same transcriptor factor was used, and you find that for the vast majority of cases, the DWT indeed does better than, than the weight matrix model. The reason I'm not showing you this is because I don't understand the HD Selex data. Okay? There are, so I know when people analyze this, they look for KMERS, they take one round, they, you know, so on, so on, so on. I understand you can do this, but I'd like to write down a model that says what's the probability of the entire data set, all rounds, how many times do I see each sequence given that I assume it has a certain total binding energy? And that model doesn't work. Okay, there are lots and lots of sequences that stick around that shouldn't. Um, and so that's why I'm not showing you yet because I don't feel comfortable yet that I understand what's going on in, in, in that data. Yeah, is there a straightforward way to go further than looking at pairs, including pair correlations? Because you said this doesn't lead to overfitting, so could one go further? without overfitting and just gaining? Um, not sure. So I spent some time trying to, uh, trying to see if I can do a more general Markov random field where I don't have to constrain myself to trees. Because especially for this protein contact prediction problem, that would be great. Because I think we know the contacts are not trees, right? Anyway, but, but you can't get the nice factorization anymore. And, and, and so, yes, yeah, so you would get these higher order terms that you would have to integrate over. And, um, yeah, so it's not obvious to me how to do the factors. I mean, we can talk about it, but so I don't know how to do it. It's the simple answer. Can I take Eric? Magnus? Ah, sorry. I can take questions, of course, your lunch break, 11.15, Yeah.